Hello everybody, I hope you're well. So this month's vlog is a little different to normal as I've been working on client work that I can't share yet and I've had lots of personal stuff going on. Good stuff, not bad stuff, like lovely family events and the like. So I haven't had as much time in the studio creating as usual. So I thought it might be nice to give you a little bit of a potted history of my creative career so far instead um, to introduce those of you who don't know my background to what I've done before now and also how I went from being a fine art graduate through printing t-shirts for musicians to becoming an illustrator with an agent. It's quite a long story so I've broken it down into two parts and this video is the first. So while I talk I thought I'd just show you the painting of the next piece in my bird series which is this little pair of sparrows. I hope you enjoy it and as usual if you have any questions about anything please do leave me a comment below. Okay here we go. Uh, once upon a time there was a little girl who loved to draw. I did. I loved drawing. I was that classic child, always drawing, making stories, that sort of thing. And my favourite thing to do at school was to write a story so that I could draw the pictures to go with it. I remember that for special stories we'd be allowed to bind them with thread and sugar paper and make little books. I think we've still got some around somewhere. My family are all creative and creative hobbies were always encouraged as I was growing up and it seemed pretty inevitable that I would follow an art path. In fact, so much so that my parents actually picked my secondary school because it had a good art department and I'm so grateful they did. My art teacher was really fierce but she taught me all of the rules of drawing and painting and how to study a subject and draw influence from others. By the time I'd left school I pretty much pigeonholed myself into creative subjects but that didn't matter because it was where I was happiest and I studied photography, art and drama at A level. And after that, I went on and studied a foundation course at Falmouth Art College, which was basically an art pick and mix. It was brilliant. A year spent finding out what you love to do the most. We tried pretty much everything. There was fashion, sculpture, printmaking, textiles, 3D design, photography, drawing. The list goes on. It was such a fun year. And for that final half term, I settled on painting. Mostly because I wasn't hot on making decisions. And at that time, I figured that painting was quite open for interpretation. So after my foundation, I went on to the University of Brighton and studied fine art painting, which was a really brilliant three years. I loved my course and the people I met there. The thing about art school is that you kind of get immersed in a creative environment and surrounded by people from all walks of life who are pursuing their wildest creative dreams. There's painters, musicians, illustrators, potters, textile designers, dancers, sculptors, you name it. We all studied separately, but because the college building was quite small, there was a great community spanning all the disciplines. And I learned so much from being in that melting pot of big creative energy. I spent the three years there exploring the world through my art and I made little monoprint drawings alongside huge paintings and my work took on a strange and vague narrative. I became intrigued by untold stories, like all the little lives going on around me, all full of stories that I'd never know. And that interest has never really waned from my work. It's a constant theme running concurrent with my other interests, especially the natural world, that still feed my art. The only doubt I had about my path was when I was in my third year and my tutor came to me and told me that my work was quite illustrative and that perhaps I should think about being on the illustration course instead, um, which I did consider but only for about three seconds and then I decided that I'd come this far in my degree and I wasn't about to start again. So after that I went on to graduate with quite an average 2-1. I was undeterred though because I was also lucky enough to win an outstanding graduate award and alongside that my first gallery show. I sold some work, which was a great thrill, but when the dust settled on that, I realised that perhaps I needed to do something a bit more practical while I figured out my next move. So shortly after graduating, I ended up moving back to Cornwall for 10 months, and in that time, I worked in my dad's furniture shop in Truro, helping out with making the shop catalogues and adverts. My digital experience at that time was really abysmal, but he had a graduate from the graphic design course at Falmouth working for him and she kind of took me under her wing and she gave me a ripped off version of Photoshop and taught me all about all the design basics and um, such as how to use Photoshop itself, how to set up files to print and edit pictures to look their best and it turned out that actually those 10 months would be one of the most valuable experiences of my life because they're all skills that I still use all the time. 
10 months of working there was enough for me to know that a career in graphic design really wasn't the one for me. But I was grateful to being given a job where I learned so much and I managed to save lots of money from being at home again. And as that year came to a close, my boyfriend and I attended a family wedding in Hawaii and took a six week road trip around the southern USA. It was great. That freedom and all of the sights we saw and the people we met really bolstered my confidence hugely and that's when I knew I wanted to work for myself. We decided to move back to Brighton after that as we still had a lot of friends there and I was just really craving that creative environment again. So we moved back with no jobs lined up, which was kind of foolish, but we had the confidence of youth back then. And after a couple of false starts, we managed to find jobs eventually, and he worked for a karaoke company, and I ended up in a call centre doing market research. I really didn't like that job at all. I mean, who who's ever liked working in a call centre? But I was calling people and asking them to do telephone surveys, and I'm not even a huge fan of being on the phone as it is. But I pretty quickly realised that all of the people that worked there were drawn in by the flexible hours because you chose what you wanted to work each week. And it turned out that a lot of them were also artists and musicians of one sort or another. Despite that, when I was working there, I genuinely felt all of the joy de vivre I had sap out of my body the minute I stepped through the doors. The managers were lovely, but I absolutely hated the job and the building. All that blue, the blue blues and the flickering fluorescent lights and the headsets that were difficult to hear through just sapped my energy so badly. It was only the flexible hours that made me stay, but the hours spent listening to the phone ring unanswered over and over and then the sudden surprise when someone answered and the even bigger surprise when they actually wanted to do a survey. They were just so bone-crushingly tedious. So I started taking in a sketchbook to scribble in while I sat there listening to that horrible ringing sound and I would tally off the completed surveys on the edge of the page to work out whether I'd achieved my bonus or not. And while I waited for a willing surveyee, I drew and I wrote and I dreamed of what I could do when I had time to paint. Over time I met some really interesting people there though and I can credit some of them with helping me with what came next because they listened to my ideas and questioned me when they got a bit too fancy. The Christmas after I started doing that job I was really skint and I decided for presents that I'd buy some cheap blank t-shirts from H&M and stencil some simple images of birds and top hats onto them because that's what I was drawing at, my at the time in my sketchbook. They were really fun to make and pleasingly they were all really well received by the recipients and it was then that I had like a proper light bulb moment. I'd been searching for a way to monetize my artwork and make my ideas saleable and I thought this could be it. My survey job sketchbook became a most valuable tool at that time. The contents of my brain just like poured out over the pages while I hashed out ideas and just absentmindedly did the minimum amount of surveys I could get away with. I really wanted to make more of the t-shirts and tried to start selling them, so I looked to the internet for inspiration and came across the thriving indie art scene in America. The handmade movement over there seemed really exciting to me and there was people making stuff and selling it online and at fairs and in little boutiques and the whole community of artisans and bloggers were just all supporting each other and I just desperately wanted to be a part of it. So I avidly read the indie blogs checking in every day with my favourites and I found out about several artists making t-shirts and printing them onto blanks by a company called American Apparel. Um, but bear in mind this was 2004 and before we all know what we know now about them. Um, but back then they were so much nicer than the fruit of the loom and the gildan that you could get over here. And I set out to find out how I could get my hands on some. And thankfully they did have a UK office and a few days later I was excitedly holding a pack of their line sheets and fabric sam samples in my eager mitts. Um, so I ordered some pieces and can you believe I still had to fax orders through back then? Like the, you just couldn't order online, you had to fax them through. Um, but anyway, I started stenciling on them and all the time thinking up my range and imagining who would wear them. The only thing was that I didn't have anywhere to sell them yet. Um, I just had my MySpace to show them off but my boyfriend had started making websites on the side of his main job and sweetly he said he'd make me a website too. Um, so my survey sketchbook became a website design mood board and it was where I hashed out the name of my new business. The name for my business, Bombi Forest, came about because at the time I'd been drawing lots of little birds with speech bubbles saying Bonjour! And I initially thought that perhaps the company would be called Bonjour Bird. I decided, oh sorry about my French accent by the way, <laughs> Bonjour Bird. I decided this was too twee and cutesy in the end and started to think of an alternative. 
Um, and it turns out that my surname Foster is an anagram of Forest, so I thought that would be a good starting point. And then I started to play around with Bonjour Bird, eventually shortening it to shortening it to Bonby, and thus Bonby Forest was born. So the website was up and running um, after a little while, um, but it wasn't long before I realised that stenciling actually wasn't going to be that sustainable. This was pre-Etsy in the UK, so I was having to get the word out on my own. So I hadn't even sold that much by that point, but I was so determined to get it right that I was being really diligent with costings and I had to concede that stenciling was just far too time consuming. I realised that screen printing them was probably the way I was going to have to go, um, but even after spending three years at art school, I didn't actually know how to screen print. Um, I guess that's the problem with just being like an easily intimidated introvert there, because I just, to me, the art room, the print rooms just felt very male dominated and they were just a scary place to me. So unless I needed to use a photocopier, I never went in there. But thank goodness for the internet and a very patient man at the screen print supply shop because without him I would not know how to how to screen print because with his help I figured it out and even how to burn screens, burn the pictures onto the emulsion uh, using a 100 watt bulb and a tin foil lampshade hanging in the fireplace of our flat it was so basic. There was a lot of trial and error, but washing out the emulsion from the first successfully exposed screen in the bath with the shower head, of course, and pulling those first screens was such a thrill. I remember actually squeaking with delight quite a lot when I was doing it. I had finally got the Bombi ball rolling. You may or may not remember that the internet in 2004 was a very different place than it is now. We had MySpace, but social media marketing just wasn't a thing at all, like we'd never heard of it. Um, there was word of mouth though, and a few discerning people were writing blogs that were actually worth reading. And going back to my obsession with the American indie scene, I absorbed myself into that and I sought out those blogs and wrote to them asking to be featured. And lots of them did feature me, and it was just all really exciting. I'd started selling properly, and people I'd never met were actually buying my stuff with my art on it. Um, it was around this time that I also started making jewellery out of vintage beads. I was no jeweller, but I knew how to put shapes and colours together, and those started selling too. And then I got a real leg up. So going back a little bit, one of the first people I met at university was a girl named Natasha. Our rooms were next door to each other in halls, and when the time came to move out of there, we rented a house together for the remainder of university. She's a musician and after lots of hard work was starting to get some recognition under the name Bat for Lashes and around early 2006 we were chatting and she told me that her manager had secured her a slot at our favourite music festival at the time which was called All Tomorrow's Parties and it was held at Pontins in Campus Hands um, and she needed some merch for her merch stall so she asked me if I'd make her run of t-shirts to sell. So I designed a magical illustration of winged horses, deer, wolves and stars. It's very bat flashes. And we decided on a run of 100. And I would take my costs of buying the t-shirts and we would split the profits. Well, we took them to ATP and set up our little merch stall. And I went and watched the first half of her show and then hurried back to keep an eye on the stall so my boyfriend could go and watch a bit too. And he came back about two songs later saying that you could hear a penny drop in there and that the room was absolutely packed. People had been going through her set to the bar but not making it that far because she was absolutely mesmerising everybody. And well, after the show we were absolutely inundated. We sold all 100 of the good prints and then a load of seconds that I'd stashed under the table just in case. And they had my inky fingerprints all over them too but people were just clamouring for them so we sold them as well. It was absolute madness. I managed to find this little video of us on the stool that day. So when we got home, we excitedly made plans to print more, and this time we listed them on my website and I fulfilled the orders. Natasha's trust in me to follow this through was a real boost for Bombay Forest, and I designed another t-shirt for her, which we also sold at shows. And over a few years, I ended up printing several runs of both designs, and as she got more successful, I shipped them all over the world to her merch stalls. It was brilliant. In the summer of 2006, I moved back to Cornwall. I'd been thinking of it anyway, but a family emergency fast-forwarded the process and I was spun back into rural life with just Bombay Forest to rely on. 
it was actually a really trying time because while things were going well it wasn't actually enough to live off on its own um, but thankfully my boyfriend and I were able to move back in with my parents which was handy because they were just really kind and we only had to make a small contribution and um, because during that time I also had to look after my mum's horses and cats and the dog and her livery yard where people kept their horses on our fields. Um, this is all because my brother had had a really bad accident and was in hospital in Germany for seven really long weeks and of course my mum was there by his bedside that whole time. So yeah, it was just really good to be on site regardless of my finances and just to be around to help take care of everything. So I set myself up in a room of my parents' house and I was still printing t-shirts for Bat for Lashes by then and also by this point I was making runs of different designs for Dan Lassac versus Scroobius Pip who'd heard about me via the Bat for Lashes t-shirts because um, I've actually had the foresight to print my website into the hems of those um, and I was also printing for other small ventures alongside my own designs and still making the jewellery as well. So when my home life calmed down, I was able to throw myself into working on Bombay Forest and decided to expand the website by selling the work of other designer makers. So in 2007, the website morphed into the Bombay Forest Indie Emporium and stocked the work of other designers and makers. There was about 40 of them from around the world and it was really fun to run and I met lots of other fellow makers and designers. But it turns out that running a shop and printing merch left me very little time to actually make my own work. So after a couple of years in 2009, I closed the Emporium to concentrate on making my own things again. With more time on my hands to design and make properly again, my products finally evolved and the jewellery line expanded. And by this time I was selling little lockets with decal images on the front, which I did for several years. But eventually production got too much, so they evolved into enamel pendants and pins, which I could outsource and still sell today. Um, and for a while I was releasing limited edition collections a few times a year, of pins, jewellery, scarves, a t-shirt or jumper. And things are going quite well selling on my website and Etsy and not on the high street and through a few other independent boutiques as well. So yeah, things continued like this through the early 10s when I also got married and had my first baby and I managed to keep going, juggling looking after my daughter and working with my husband's help and I enlisted my sister-in-law to help me put together the jewellery like on a freelance basis. Looking back, I probably could have expanded the business before I had my baby but the thought of having to manage staff just filled me with terror <laughs> so I kept it small and manageable. Then when I came out the other side of the newborn haze, I had this real strong desire to create more art just for me. I'd always carried on drawing, of course, to create new products and print designs, and I'd been painting intermittently all along too, which I was selling as prints, but painting wasn't really working out with me, for me with a baby in tow. It was just too messy, and I didn't have enough time to really get stuck in alongside packing orders and still screen printing lots of scarves and jumpers. Um, I'd actually worked out that if I went flat out, I could get 10 scarves printed and heat set during one of my baby's hour-long naps. Um, so this was the time when the humble Sharpie market entered my life and everything changed. It turns out that felt tips are really easy to use on the sofa, which had become my office while I was feeding my baby or just too tired to sit up at the desk. And there was no painting mess to clear up and I could zip them all away in a bag in seconds when I'd finished drawing. And I carried on using felt tips even when I made the return to my little desk in the corner of our living room. And when our son was born a couple of years later, they helped me to keep making art throughout that time as well. And it just became a lovely way to unwind while my daughter watched CBeebies and my baby son slept. And I started doing a 100 day project on Instagram called These 100 Days of Random Colours, where I blindly select four colours from my pencil case and another one from one of those little biros where you click down a different colour. I had one with four, like red and green and black and blue. And I'd use that to add little details on top of the Sharpie drawings. And just for 20 minutes each day, I allowed myself to draw whatever the colours brought to mind. And I look back on those drawings now and they seem very naive and unfinished but I loved what I was making at that time and I still go back to them for ideas if I'm stuck. So I guess those sketchbooks are being used for what sketchbooks should be used for really just to practice and figure things out and come back to it at a later date which is just really nice to have that stash in my collection. 
and it was a really valuable practice and little did I know that working with limited colours and marker pens was actually the start of a very long arty love affair and the catalyst for the next stage in my creative career. So I'm going to leave it there for now and I will post part two in a week or so which will be what happened next and how I ended up where I am now which is still running Bombay Forest but in the meantime I've also written a couple of books and now I am an illustrator with a really lovely agent too. So I hope you'll stay tuned to my channel to find out what happened next. See you then. Bye!